All right, our second topic today. Uh, just, I guess, in the, within the past week, AT&T, AT&T has announced that there was a hack of data involving cell phone calls and, and text messages and so forth, involving pretty much all of their customers at, back in 2022. And, and this had me wondering, you know, like, okay, well, they're keeping all this information for a period of time, you know, and so like, what responsibilities should they have? Now, there have been class action lawsuits filed as a response to this. And, you know, this is at and second data issue this year. Um, but I want to start, you know, we'll, I want to kick it to you on the, all of this stuff, but I want to start just with what's your reaction to seeing, you know, like at and again in the crosshairs here, but, you know, this huge data leak, cell phone, you know, like, like calls being made, text messages and so forth, like all their customers, you know, 70 <laughs> some million or, or more, you know, what, 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 what did you make of that? Or what was your reaction to seeing that? Well, my initial reaction as an at and wireless customer myself was, um, I'm glad I don't do any crazy stuff, you know, behind my wife's back <laughs> uh, that someone could blackmail me with. So that was what I feel good that, you know, if, if it had to be my service What's my exposure provider, level? Yeah, I'm good. What's my Let's exposure go. level? Yeah, it's not that bad, so we're good. Um, <laughs> so that's true that I am an at and customer, so everyone can go on the dark web and start, you know, analyzing see who my you stuff. you were calling and texting. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll see all of our stupid texts um, between each other. No, but but on a serious note, I mean, look, it, uh, one of my first feelings was it's another, it's another confirmation that privacy is not what it was when you and I were little. Um, you know, this idea that you can find privacy um, in maybe uh, the way that you communicate now in the modern era and to think that no one's ever going to see it. Um, kind of reminds me of, I remember when um, a few years ago, uh, Emmanuel Macron, who was the president of France, it came out in the news that uh, his WhatsApp account had been hacked. And at the time, a lot of people thought that WhatsApp was totally encrypted and unhackable. And it was just like, you know, so to me, it's like that. Like, all right, well, anything that a human being makes, I guess someone else can figure out how to break. And it's just the old cops and robbers thing, right? So yeah. You know, that's kind of what I felt like. All right, well, that's another example. There's no privacy. And, you know, we all got to be careful about what we put in writing and put in these devices and all that. And that's it. Yeah, well, you put it to the air, basically, because, yeah, yeah. if you only safe places in your head, you know, like, and that's been, you know, that's been quoted in movies for now. and books and all that. <laughs> and so, yeah, for now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but actually, I took it one step further than you. Like, I agree with you that, yes, the, the anything that is you, you put, into a device or, you know, like, you know, again, it could just be out into the air because, you know, the old fashioned bugging you know, of rooms and all this other stuff. But or and that could be your own cell phone, by the way. You know, yeah. you carry around the bug because you got this live mic there, you know, that hey, when you, you can say, you know, hello, Alexa or whatever the, the prompt is. And if it can hear that and respond, that means it's always listening. So beyond just that, I think the, the if you ask the question of why, there's no more privacy. Like we had s- telephones, you know, in the 80s or 90s or whatever, but the systems weren't in place and the technology wasn't such that it could record all record all the information and store it indefinitely. And I think this really goes back to the storage of this information indefinitely. Now, there, we're going to talk about this. There could be reasons to, to store information and so forth uh, as far as, you know, it could be, oh, well, we want to store people's calls in case we want to go back and look for terrorist attacks and all this other type of stuff. But that's the real vulnerability here because it's very clear that anything that's stored can be accessed by uh, illicitly. And so the real question to me, this boils down to is that, well, I think, and I don't think we're having this conversation as a society. And I think we should is what should be allowed in terms of storing of information? Like, should they be able to store our calls or our text messages or, you know, whether it's just the number that was actually communicated with or the actual content or any of that stuff? Should they be allowed to store that stuff for indefinitely, you know, like or should you be able to say, hey, I want all my stuff deleted after a month or all my stuff deleted after two months or six months or whatever it would be? Should you have control over that? And then, you know, if they don't do that, obviously, that would create a substantial amount of liability on their part. Um, which would ideally be the deterrence. But that's where my mind went to with this is that, well, hey, why don't I have any control over how much they're stealing my debt? I have control. Like if I want to keep, you know, if I get bills mailed to me or whatever, if I want to keep them all after a year, if I want to go take them and shred them or whatever, I get, I, that's my choice. And if I keep them all at my house and then somebody gets into my house and takes all that paper, that's my fault. But I at least have the control over how long I want to hold things, keep things and, you know, 
the, the things that could be used, you know, like to, to, to learn about me. But the incentive on the other side is that they want to keep all this stuff so they can analyze it and, and, and do stuff with it and, and, and commercialize the information. So there's a give and take there, but it seems like the consumer is not really accounted for. Yeah, and I think that's where, um, you know, you're right. I mean, the word consumer is great because this is where things like consumer regulation and laws come into play. Like, because um, I'm thinking about what you're saying is 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 accurate that everyone, the data itself is an asset. Yeah. And everyone, not everyone, but, but the different factions like me or you as a consumer versus AT&T or Verizon or whoever else is a ser- service provider, we both have a different way that we see that asset. Yeah. For me, I'm thinking as my asset. This is my information. And they're looking at it as brain. a pot of gold. <laughs> yeah, and they're looking at it as, as an adding asset. Adding to this pot of gold, but, yeah. then, but then they create this target. that well, you but, know, but where I was going is there, in their mind, the asset can be commoditized. Yeah. And that's where you're going at either internally for them to help themselves get learn how to get better at refining things like their marketing and what, how we buy and consume from them. Or B, they can sell it on the data market, which is a huge market. And for other people that want to, um, or other companies that want to learn about us yeah. as the consumer and how to market to us. And this is a thing that how we, we all get taken into this. Because everybody watching this, I'm sure, because you're either listening or watching it to it on some platform that you had to sign a term of a service, a term of service agreement type of thing. And a license that agreement was, to use the software. Yeah, the, like, the, that, yeah. which was in two point font. That you scrolled down, you know, and didn't read any of it, <laughs> and you hit OK because you wanted to use the device or you wanted to get on YouTube or whatever it was. So I think that's how th- this is a classic example of, uh, of kind of the the push and pull with, let's say, the regulatory environment. Where Which the, the regulatory environment is needed because individual consumers would never be able to like if you don't want to sign those terms and conditions, you just can't use the device, you know. And so it's like. So you either have to turn all that stuff down and or and not have access to any of that stuff or you you have to just accept these contract terms, these contract of appearance. And so, yeah, for us to have any shot, that's what a government and, and regulators are for is to put, give us some some negotiating power. We the people versus these huge co- commercial entities. Yeah. And I think part of the problem, I mean, this might not be as much with telecom right now, but more with kind of the, the whole real big tech and algorithms is. Uh, these things are becoming such black boxes, kind of how the technology works. Uh, now we got AI coming into this and all that is, number one, it's moving so fast. Uh, and number two is it, it's it's complex enough that a lot of the regulators don't even understand, you know, yeah. this stuff. Well, particularly so, lawmakers, I mean, you have regulators that yeah. at least get it. But a lot of times the regulators, you know, like <laughs> as we just saw with the Supreme Court, they get their 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 legs chopped off and they aren't, yeah. they aren't able to really make the changes. So what do you think? On, on the flip side, you know, like so or, you know, just kind of looking at it holistically, just ask the question, do you think they should be allowed to the, the companies like this, whether it be, you know, telecom, whether it be big, big tech, you know, whatever, because as you pointed out, AI, part of the what AI is doing, they want to, to feed all this data into AI and, and then get recommendations or, or figure out ways to optimize and further commercialize it and so forth, how to market to us and everything like that. So it, the, the use of it is ongoing and, and will be ramping up. So do you think they should be allowed to that? businesses should be allowed to keep in storage all this data or do you think consumers should have more of a say in how what you can keep how long you can keep it and so forth especially because um, it seems like they can't you know people can't secure it and you know just factors you think that are important when, when looking um, at that uh, no it's a good question I, i'm kind of neutral on it honestly um i i could i could think of various arguments both sides obviously feeling as a consumer that it's my information it's private all that you know obviously i could i could take and, that and side they can't, con- they can't secure it <laughs> I like it. No, but what I'm saying is, but as a as a business owner and then as a professional who's licensed in an industry that requires um, maintaining certain information, even after, let's say, a client relationship is separated, yeah. um, then I understand that side. So, for example, I'll, I'll expound on that real quick for the audience. I'm in, I'm in the financial world, so I've got securities licenses. So FINRA, which stands for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, um, mandates that we hold uh, client records for seven years after a, a client relationship is terminated. So if a person is a current client, you got to hold the information because they're a current client, you know, forever, as long as they're a client. But even if someone were to die or decide to leave me because they don't like me, they want to go somewhere else, I have to keep all their stuff on file for seven years. 
Why is that? It's not because I'm trying to go and look at it two years after, you know, the, the, the person's no longer with us and, and start looking at their social and all that. It's because there's a statute of limitations in the law and there's things that could come up. I might get a subpoena from the IRS two years after I, you know, the relationship has ended with me because the IRS has, you know, a tax fraud case on this person that goes back five years yeah. and they need information from when the client was with me. Um, it could be that the client's getting a divorce, for example, and maybe they left me six months ago or they died or well, they can't get a divorce. Yeah, they wouldn't, they died, I don't so. know that that would, um, yeah, that would be like a post birth abortion. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, but, but no, but you get it. Like if yeah, there's a yeah. divorce or something after the fact. So the idea, so if you think about it, then that makes sense based on the way our society structured that there's something called the statute of limitations in terms of bringing legal action against somebody after the fact. So what the industry said is we need you to be able to keep, you have to keep these records for X amount of years because think about it, somebody could plan to do a crime, jump from one financial firm to another or plan to divorce and, and, and screw their ex-spouse out of, yeah. of income. And, and if we didn't have any of these regulations, when someone leaves, I could decide, hey, I don't want to have to pay for the area to store all this data. Because I remember when I started in the industry, I mean, I had a, I, I started as a young guy in a big corporate office that was 30,000 square feet and took up a whole floor of an office building. Half of that at the time was storage cabinets, mm. filing cabinets for paper. And a lot of that was some of these old records that the firm had to keep. So most companies don't want to pay for that kind of like real estate. Like why pay that rent for that if I don't need to? So without regulation, they wouldn't keep it. But I understand the regulations there because the society may need to go back for those records yeah. within the first few years. So well, that's, that's why I'm neutral. Yeah, I mean, that's instructive because I mean, in my industry as well, in the, in the law, and, and, you know, I'm an attorney and in my industry, like, there are certain requirements in terms of maintaining paperwork, document, documentation and so forth. Uh, but I think that could be instructive in terms of, okay, so maybe you don't want, a lot of times the solution to something isn't just to go the, the complete 180 and go the exact other way. Like, so there could be, it could be a setup where unless there's a legal requirement, otherwise saying that you have to keep the information for a certain amount of time, then you have to give the customer a choice or whatever. Like, so there are ways still to solve it, but I would agree with you that it's not something that you can just say, okay, everybody just has to delete all data after six months. That wouldn't be a real solution. Rarely are solutions ever that simple, but I do think the conversation needs to be had. And also from an industry wide or industry standpoint, because I don't think that those same concerns, there are concerns from a social media standpoint or from a telecom standpoint in terms of if we're, you know, like wanting to, you know, the, the, the big thing ever since 9-11 was invading privacy for the purposes of uh, preventing or, or solving terrorism, um, which whatever you think about that, you know, in terms of whether or not you can, you give up liberty for security and Benjamin Franklin and all that stuff, that's the law of the land now. Um, and so there may be reasons why AT&T or, or, you know, uh, social media or whatever would keep information for those purposes. But I'm sure smart people can get in a room and figure out a way that we can minimize the risk to everyone with these hacks happening all the time or these breaches happening all the time. We can minimize the risk while still serving those purposes. And I just don't know that the conversation is being had at all because from the company standpoint, they're not going to start the conversation, um, even though. They like at and is getting sued over this most recent hack. And so they're going to deal with a class action lawsuit. A lot of times that's a way when regulators don't come along, class action lawsuits come along and can can force change in an industry. But absent some clear what we think the standard should be, I think it's difficult for all of us. It makes it more difficult yeah. for the businesses. It makes it more difficult. Like in your industry, for example, is a good example. It's not difficult because you have a clear directive on what you have to do, what you're required, and you understand why. There's no reason why we can't develop that more broadly, you know, in places where it's needed, places where it's not, where information can be take, can be kept, where either it can't be kept or you have to give the customer an option. And then you know, that creates the real legal incentive because if you're not allowed to keep it or if you have to delete it unless the customer opts into it being kept or something like that, and then you keep it, a lawsuit then is going to be is going to be devastating, you know. So but yeah. I, I, again, to me, the biggest issue is that we need to have the conversation. I'm not saying I have the full laid out answer at this point, but the conversation needs to be had because this is just too much. And yeah, I mean, yeah, your, your initial point privacy is just doesn't exist anymore is is largely true but let's look at the reason for that and the reason it did for that is in large part because all nothing ever 
is gone. Enough for, nothing ever goes away, you know? Yeah. And if it stays well, and forever, also, then yeah, it can be accessed eventually. And I think also part of the paradigm shift I think we just have to make as humans in our society is that we, we whether intentionally or not, I mean, we've gotten to this point where our entire society, uh, now it's, it's necessary for us to operate within by, by being plugged into this grid, right? Like the, the, the tech grid. So at some point, in order to get plugged in and be part of this society, I mean, unless literally you want to live in the middle of the, the mountain somewhere and, and be off the grid. Um, so in order to be part of our society, at some point, you got to plug yourself in, which means that you are giving your information to someone else. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Just having a cell phone account, having a computer, you know, all this stuff just means you're somehow you're you're now a node in the bigger thing. Yeah, there's no and, g- there's no general way to opt out of this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Know? So, and that's I think you know it's in all of our interest to to make sure that we're at least thinking about if there are better ways to handle this than what we're doing it now or how we're doing it now. So, but no, I think um, we can wrap this topic from there. We appreciate everybody for joining us on this part two of this episode. Um, please stick around and join us for part three as well. <laughs>